It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. I got to tell you, I was hoping for hoping for better news to start the week. I was hoping for something good uh, to start with. I was hoping for another big win for the UAW last week uh, in their union vote at Mercedes-Benz in Alabama. But it appears that the UAW's organizing push has hit a bit of a speed bump. And, well, while you had 2,045 Mercedes workers saying, yes, we absolutely want a union, 2,642 uh, voted against, and 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 look, that's not the end of the story. I, this this is this is kind of a repeat, I think, of what we saw at Volkswagen. But you do have two thousand forty five people who say they want a union. So I'm gonna bet, I'm gonna bet they're gonna be staying active, uh, especially if Mercedes goes back on what they said they were going to do on their promises, and and because they did a lot of that, they did a lot. To keep the union out. Um, Because if you remember, you know, the UAW, you know, went through this in in, in in Tennessee. Um, You know, the big blowout victory they had uh, just a couple of weeks ago uh, is is the remnants of this kind of a uh, Volkswagen saying, hey, we're going to make a a bunch of promises um, and and, and didn't. Uh, Because if you remember, After the UAW's victory in Tennessee, I didn't say the vote in Alabama was a slam dunk. It's one of those, don't know. Uh, And the pressure that these workers were under, uh, just just incredible. Uh, The captive audience meetings, the the constant harassment in the workplace. And then, and then, you know, all of the stuff in the community with business leaders and religious leaders, politicians doing their foolhardy best to, well threaten and intimidate and the reality is is especially in alabama people have been trained since conception to hate labor unions so the fact that you got such a large percentage of people to say yes is is encouraging uh and and understand you know and i think sean fain said it best he says i i know what these workers are put under it's just another indicator, another issue with this nation of how poorly the laws are structured for working class people. He said all the laws made favor business. The courts are structured to favor business over people. And that's reality. The fact that these workers had to endure you know, the kind of captive audience meetings and harassment, not just again from the employer, but all of the societal pressures, kind of a big deal. Uh, now, the union had reported that they had a supermajority of, of cards signed. And this, again, shows just how effective these union busting campaigns are, how effective these threats and these intimidation tactics are. Now, here's the thing. They, they, made, they, they made a lot of, lot of progress here. Uh, and and in, a, in a press release, uh, the UAW said, look, you know, these workers, they won some major things. They won some serious gains in this campaign, something they called the UAW bump. Uh, They said that they killed the wage tiers. They got rid of a CEO that nobody seemed to like, had no interest in making life better there. They, because of this this campaign, because of their efforts, have made their lives and their jobs better. Now, will that hold? And as they pointed out, look, in 2019, Volkswagen did the same thing. And in 2024, the workers realized it's not about a CEO. It's about having some power, having a voice on the job. That, having that union contract, that is what you should be fighting for. And I love the way that that Fain, you know, and the UAW framed it. And you go, look, you know, this is a David-Goliath fight. And sometimes Goliath wins a battle. But David wins the war. And the idea being, look... You know, you're going to pick up your, you're going to pick up your, your, yourself off the dirt. You're going to brush off and you're going to move forward. What these workers do from this fo- point forward is up to them. And he's very clear about that. Look, we're here to ensure that workers' lives get better. And the fact that there are more than 2,000 workers at, Ala- at Mercedes in Alabama who want to join a union, 
Um, they're going away. And as they point out in their piece, the sun will rise and the sun will set and our fight for justice for the working class will continue. And I got to tell you, I, I love I love that frame because it really is. It's about the frame that I talk about all the time. Union job, better life. They're 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 walking the walk, talking the talk and and doing everything they can do to make this possible. Now, you know, we'll see what happens in the coming elections or a couple more uh, that are, are potentially going to happen in the in the coming weeks and months. Hyundai in, in Montgomery, Alabama. I, I understand there are 30 percent or more that have signed cards there. Uh, you also had a Toyota uh, and in Missouri, Troy, Missouri, I believe uh, that they're at that threshold where there's going to potentially an election. So down the road, we're going to see more more opportunities. And this is a good thing. Uh, understand, this isn't one and done. This isn't, uh, you know, they're going to go away. I truly believe Fane when they say they're not going anywhere. So this is, again, the start of something that I hope is big. Uh, now, I had hoped, I had hoped that uh, the workers would have pushed back against the intimidation, pushed back against, you know, the, the, the stuff that they had to endure. Uh, but we'll see. And, and again, for all of us, the rest of us, how bad are our labor laws that you have to endure that kind of abuse? I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Quick break, right back. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work... For America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So last week, uh, another charter school week. It seems to me like they're they're almost every other week at this point. Uh, and you go, well, how did you know last week was charter school week? Well, my e- email box, inundated uh, with well-paid uh, spokespeople out there pimping the uh, the wares and also spreading the ills of, of government schools. I can't tell you last week how many times I read government schools. Not your local public schools, not your local public schools, but government schools. Uh, and interestingly enough, you know, this week comes right after Teacher Appreciation Week, uh, which is just, again, weird. And, and I guess this is how what they do. Uh, but again, another gimmick. I mean, you know, they've got all of these different gimmicks on how they're going to destroy and take away public education from us. Uh, if it's EITCs, the Educational Improvement Tax Credits, or the ESAs, or the PPPs, or the EMOs, or the EIEIOs, well, they're going to figure it out. If there's a gimmick, if there's a way to get into taxpayers' pockets and privatize education and, well, take from our kids, they're going to figure it out. Uh, I'm here to share, ask, to share some questions on uh, how do vouchers defund public educations i've asked my next guest to come talk with us josh cowens is a professor and author author of the book the privateers how billionaires created a culture war and sold school vouchers josh thanks for taking time for us yeah thanks happy to be here so you know last week like i said inundated with all of these we've got this privatization scheme we've got this other scheme your local public school's bad this new shiny thing good Um, It really is remarkable how much of our tax dollars they put in to convincing us how bad our public schools are. Right. Yeah, that's right. And uh, in the case of the voucher system in particular, uh, you have a a new bill uh, in Pennsylvania coming through that's that's specifically based on this. In most other states, um, these voucher schemes, so these are taxpayer funded uh, private school tuition schemes. uh, They first begin with uh, the idea that public schools are failing parents. 
and that parents should have a right to uh, take their kids out of the public school system uh, on the tax paradigm and uh, move them to whatever type of, of school they would like they would like to go to. Those are two different sort of pieces, right? It's it's um, the, the parents' rights version of, of things. Uh, we could talk about that if we need you, but then in particular, this idea that public schools are failing um, and that we should provide taxpayer-funded alternatives to that. Uh, it's, it's not how the data look and it's not uh, what the evidence says, but um, but that's what they say. No, it's quite remarkable on what, on what liberties they take. And what's sure. interesting to me is, you know, in places that don't have a lot of uh, charter schools or a lot of these gimmicks, a lot of rural communities, uh, these ideas are, are, it's amazing to me, uh, but are, are really popular given the fact that they, I don't think people understand that it's going to destroy their local public schools. They don't have those competing systems yet, but when they do, those local schools are going to suffer. And we see this going on right now in Iowa because Iowa just passed a really horrible bill uh, that's going to cost the school, public school system millions of dollars. And you know, we've got schools doing three, four days a week now instead of five. Right. So it's important to sort of think through how this works. And there are actually a, a number of, of rural uh, Republicans. There's bipartisan opposition to vouchers in rural communities for the simple reason, as you already suggested, that uh, there aren't any private schools for uh, for kids to go to or there are very few of them in these rural communities. Um, but that doesn't mean that the rural communities and, and communities that don't have a ton of private schools aren't at funding risk. So the first way that vouchers defund public schools is at the state level. And the reason for that is that it's it's despite all the rhetoric about about uh, giving parents a choice to send their kids to these schools, three quarters of voucher users in state after state after state that's passed these schemes, three quarters are already in private school or at least have never attended public school. They're in, you know, homeschool or something like that. Um, so what that means automatically right off the bat is that that these voucher schemes are are benefiting uh, people who are not sort of attending public schools for the most part in the first place. The way that that they defund the public education system, though, is because over time states can't afford to stand up two sectors of education. They're already committing dollars. Most state constitutions tell them they have to commit uh, dollars to public education. Um, and, and yet what happens when states decide to take on a new cost that's currently borne by the private sector by increasingly wealthy parents who are getting these voucher schemes, the state just can't afford to do it and they slow down public spending. Six out of the last seven states that have passed voucher schemes uh, have failed to keep up with the national average on public school spending. So that's the first thing to, to, to know. The second thing to know is that in the local districts that do lose a handful of kids to a, a few private schools, um, again, we're only talking about a quarter of total voucher users, or so 20 to 25 percent. But those at the district level, those kids do um, uh, leave and they take some state dollars with them. Meanwhile, all of the costs stay with the district. Um, the way the analogy I use is, is I have a daughter in college. I have a second one about to go. Uh, just because I have two children who have left the home for nine months out of the year, that, that doesn't mean I, I have to stop paying mortgage on their bedrooms, right? I still have a fixed home and I still have my utilities and I still got to pay for the whole thing, despite the fact that two of my kids are now, now, now gone. That's actually kind of how it works in the public school communities that lose. They might only lose five or six kids, but those five or six kids take really, really important dollars with them. Uh, when they go. No, and that's important to point out that you can't have competing systems. And this is where I've I've been a, a supporter of public education because it is public. If we're not happy with what's going on, we can change it as opposed to the private sector, which is uh, take it or leave it. Or we're just going to, if, if your kid's not keeping up, we're just throwing them back somewhere else, which then ends up the public school then becomes a default for well, all of the the creaming that goes on in these these other these other schemes. For me, I want to use those dollars more, as, most efficiently as possible by creating the best opportunities for for all kids, not just mine, but all of them. Um, and I don't think that that's really what we're being preached to. No, and in fact, one of the one of the misconceptions is that you know. Uh, that the private sector is providing this elite alternative that 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 only a handful of kids get, and that a voucher system would give some children the the ability to leave so-called failing schools for those elite providers. That's actually not the typical private school. The typical private school is what I call a subprime private school. You mentioned PPP uh, in your in your open. Uh, a typical private school is actually desperate to get the taxpayer bailout that comes with. Uh, a voucher system. They're not particularly high quality. I mean, for, for, for every elite 
academy or whatever it is that that you know do exist and, and states do have there are dozens and dozens um, of struggling schools financially distressed schools schools that aren't very good at actually educating children and so what we've found over the last decade as voucher systems have spread across the country and have grown into statewide basis is that the users of those subprime schools have shown some of the largest negative declines in academic outcomes that we've ever seen in any question in the research community in education. It's really um, in, in terms of just the scale and the size of the of the negative impact, you have to go to something like the COVID-19 pandemic itself or Hurricane Katrina down in, in New Orleans to really get the magnitude of the, ne of the academic decline for the kids who do transfer using these voucher schemes. And again, the reason for that is they're not going to these elite providers. They're going to these subprime schools that are desperate for the financial bailout. Um, and, and so it's, it's really not even sort of true on its own right. It's, it'd be one thing we could have the debate if a handful of children were going to these private schools and were doing better, but that's actually not what happens. Even those kids that do leave um, are really suffering academically as a result. No, I remember when the voucher things first came out. Uh, we had a state senator. His name was Mike Fulmer. He was the guy who evidently took it from somebody else and slapped his name on it because he didn't actually read it. Uh, but I had asked him, I said, look, if I get one of these golden tickets, uh, can I send my kids to the Abington Friends School in Philadelphia, which I know at the time was charging somewhere in the neighborhood of $40,000 a year for kindergarten? And he said, absolutely. It will cover all the costs and transportation. And I'm going, um, no, Senator, your bill is very clear that it's only going to pay what my local school district was paying uh, for my child's education. I would have to come up with the rest, which is well above my my ability to pay. So you're 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 peddling false false stuff here. Not and only that, but what we've seen, and you mentioned Iowa a couple of minutes ago, we've seen new data just two weeks ago came out from Iowa from re researchers at Princeton University who looked at this question. These private schools, as soon as the voucher comes, guess what they do? They increase tuition up by, by a substantial portion, even up to and including part of the voucher that they're getting. So it's not even about sort of access. But the other thing to remember, too, uh, about these schools is even if the tuition matched the voucher, uh, there's nothing in these bills. And in fact, the latest round of bill of voucher bills actually protect the school's ability to turn away anyone they want. They can discriminate against anyone they want. When it comes to vouchers, it's not actually the school choice. It's it's the school's choice. Right. And that's what we have to remember about this. The schools get to pick any child they want. Uh, and even when they get to pick the kids they want, it turns out they don't do very well, uh, uh, at least not on academics. Um, so the whole thing is, it's what I call it when I uh, visited your state uh, in Pennsylvania uh, a, a few months ago, and I testified to the Pennsylvania legislature and I warned them, I said, uh, vouchers are the education equivalent of predatory lending. That's exactly what they are. The outcomes are terrible. Most parents don't get the results that the schools promise for them. The whole thing uh, is just a, is just a scheme. So basically what you're telling me is, um, you know, if I win, get one of these golden tickets, or if you're anywhere in the country, you're not going to be able to send your kids to Oxbridge Academy and rub right. elbows with Baron Trump. Then, no, no, the school gets to decide if they're going to take you, and and not only on the front end when they admit you, but they can decide they can decide if, if you get to stay too. Right, because we that's the that's the thing that gets me. A lot of people believe that it's going to give my child. And look, every parent I believe wants the best for their kids. Well, and, and wants to get them the best opportunities they're going to get, maybe the opportunities they didn't have. So this right. idea, this this sales job, this con job they're throwing out there that, hey, if I get this, my kid's going to have this opportunity to rub elbows with the upper crust. And as you're saying, that's not reality, not even close to reality. The false promise and it's the education equivalent of predatory lending. So how, how do we undo this? Because here's what bugs me, you know, and, and here cyber charters are a big thing. Vouchers are a completely different issue. Cyber yeah. charters here are a big thing too. Yeah. Um, and, and again, it's all about taking public tax dollars that are supposed to go towards educating my kids and their friends and giving them the best opportunity that they have and then dividing it into different pots and somehow putting a profit motive in there. But nothing drives me crazier than when I'm driving down the road and I hear a radio advertisement telling me how wonderful this charter system is and how wonderful this charter school is, knowing that that's my tax dollar paying for that ad and not in a classroom educating a kid. It's funny you mentioned cyber charters. You have to, the only other sort of 
man-made or person-made education intervention that that has performed as poorly academically as vouchers have are, are cyber charters. Uh, again, you have to go to something like a natural disaster, Hurricane Katrina or the pandemic itself, that those impacts on test scores to get the magnitude of what we're talking about. Uh, and, and, and cyber charters come close. The, the cyber charter pieces is, is, um, would be funny if it wasn't so tragic because when you talk to the voucher lobby and, the, and these guys go at me all day, uh, when, you, when you say, you know, there aren't very many private schools in rural communities, you know what they say? They say, it's okay, we'll create online or cyber uh, learning environments for, for kids. I mean, so that's that's one thing that they'll say. And then the other side of the mouth, they'll, they'll say, um, well, you know, we need more vouchers because the, the pandemic, uh, public schools failed students during the pandemic by not opening fast enough and by staying online, by staying in cyber uh, learning. And so to the extent, and listen, most parents will tell you they wanted their kids back in school and if they didn't they had a really good reason to like like a health reason or whatever um but we know that that it's good for kids to be in school to be in physically in school that that's certainly true um but the idea that we're going to go to a voucher system and in particular uh rural communities we're going to build out private schools with a cyber char charter type approach or cyber charters themselves the same people who are telling you that public schools failed kids by staying online long uh, too long during the pandemic are the same people now pitching you on cyber charters and on cyber vouchers um, because, as you suggest, sort of this this fits their their business model um, a little bit more carefully. So you have to kind of think about kind of they're talking on two sides out of their mouth on this one. But again, for me, it's all about destroying what we it the is. people hold as the commons. Uh, the idea of destroying public education because this is the one thing that unites us. And it seems to me that there are those uh, people with a lot of money in some cases, uh, Jeffrey Yaz here in our state, who want to you know segment that off. Well, we don't want to interact with you. You name the group, and this is another way to slice and dice and divide, especially the working poor, because those are where all the bad ideas and the gimmicks and the schemes seem to start before they then move on to other areas. Uh, I'm curious your your thoughts on that. Uh, well, I'll go you one further. In Pennsylvania, the, the draft legislation that I've read in that state would actually require your state, the Pennsylvania State Department of Education, to inform parents in in the public school districts that are struggling that they um, can and should move uh, into a voucher scheme, which is re really basically means that the current legislation would require the state to come in and advertise against the local school communities to try to move dollars out of those local communities. It would require the State Department of Ed to do that. It's really built to undermine, defund, and eventually sort of break apart the public school system. Betsy DeVos in my state, 50 miles west of me, she has said publicly over and over and over again, if it's not Jeff Yass in Pennsylvania, it's Betsy DeVos, I promise you. She has said she, she doesn't want uh, public schools to remain the centers of community. She wants to bring back an era where she says churches were the centers of community, and that's what the voucher scheme is all about there. It's certain what it is not, what it is not is anything resembling a grassroots movement. It is Betsy DeVos, it is Jeff Yass, it is Charles Koch, it is a couple of billionaires in West Texas. It is not really a bunch of people clamoring for this stuff. It is it is a um, it is a billionaire funded operation through and through. No, and the, the thing, again, I go back to what I said a minute ago. Every parent wants their kid to get the best opportunity. So if you're constantly being told uh, your local school is bad, you know, gi give me yeah. enough time and repetition, you know, I'll convince you the sky's green. Uh, and, and that's what they've done. They've convinced people that their their local schools are bad in, in, in a lot of cases and that this this wonderful, this gimmick over here, that's their that's their future. And the sad reality is it's fool's gold. It, it sure is. It's the education equivalent of predatory lending. It, it, it pitches people praise on their hopes and dreams for their children, their deepest fears and concerns for their kids. And it says, we are going to offer you a solution. And unlike, say, a new car or a used car that you're going to find out pretty quickly if it's busted or if it's a lemon, you know, it's going to start to break down on the highway. It could take years and years and years to learn uh, that the school serving your kid failed and is failing on a, on a monthly and yearly basis for the kids. It's, you know, I'm an education professor in my day job. I teach teachers. Uh, I couldn't go down the street and pick out automatically a high quality school. It's really hard to do. You have to kind of, you have to look at it. You have to trust yourself. You have to look at your opportunities if you can. Um, but the idea that, that, uh, that, that, 
that parents are going to kind of just shop around for schools and if one doesn't fit then they'll just move their kid to another that's not how it works for most parents and and again most of these uh, schools are just simply promising as you say fool's gold as i say the education of equivalent of predatory lending yeah i mean so the question then becomes you know how do we as parents how do we as voters taxpayers um you know wade through all this because look we're inundated with with madison avenue kind of advertising we're inundated with all of these wonderful success stories that seem almost in, too oh. incredible to believe uh, at least i on my radio there there's this stuff well listen i mean th there's a reason uh you know most of the bills in the last 18 months most of the voucher schemes that have passed have passed in red states uh, now, Pennsylvania is not a red state. It's a purple state. It could go either way in the upcoming election. But the, the, the reason I bring this up is that in those states, even in those states, so this is, this is for the most part a right wing push, this voucher push. But even in those red states, uh, it's the, the votes in the state legislatures are incredibly close, incredibly close, in part because rural Republicans aren't buying what these billionaires are selling and they don't like these things. So it's a, it's a cobbling together that the other side has to do to get these things passed. And that's, be, and that's with a lot of backdoor legislative shenanigans. I mean, I don't even know this stuff's not my profession, but you know, you hear this reported out, overnight votes, secret stuff, throwing things into ballots. And the reason that has to happen is that most, most voters, most parents don't want these schemes. It's not like there's this mass movement where we have to go out and tell parents, no, 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 you're, you're, you're wrong on this one. Um, Voters, parents are smart. Voters are smart. They know this stuff is garbage. Um, but what's happening is these these really, really well-funded organizations are going to state legislators. They're primary vulnerable legislators, vulnerable Republicans. They're picking off votes one by one by one to eke these things through. And yet it remains true that when vouchers go to statewide ballot, there has never been a successful statewide ballot initiative that supports voters. Time and time again, voters have rejected ballot initiatives when they're given a choice um, on vouchers. In Arizona, in 2018, the voters overwhelmingly rejected a voucher scheme there. And then you know what the Republican governor did three years later, 2021? He rammed it through a legislature anyway. So some of this just comes down to um, uh, holding holding folks accountable when they vote against the will of the people. Because, you know, parents and voters, are, are, are they, they smell... Uh, they smell a rat here on this one and they're right to do so. No, I like your frame of, uh, it's, it's just like predatory lending. That is a perfect frame. Um, it, it's amazing stuff. But uh, Josh, I appreciate you taking some time filling us in. Uh, good stuff. Hope folks will take a look at the book, The Privateers, How Billionaires yeah. Created a Culture War and Sold School Vouchers. Josh Cowens, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Take care. Want to hear your thoughts? Have you bought into these schemes, or uh, is it you know just the legislature's ramming it through? Because well, maybe the, there's money on the other side. I know there's a lot of money in this. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me Rick at the Rick Smith Show .com. Quick break. Right back. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So come middle of June, all eyes are going to be on Colorado as there's a special election. One that I've been, you know, I've been keeping an eye on because I think this is one of those great opportunities to throw one of the horrible uh, conservatives out of Congress. But June 25th in Colorado, the uh, the 4th Congressional District is having a special election. Uh, Ken Buck has stepped aside, retiring, getting out of the mix, and kind of in a, in, in a kind of a, you know, sticking it to some one way, uh, triggered this special election so that Lauren Boebert couldn't, well, just walk into it. And I love the fact that that's what's happened. But there's an opportunity here, not just to throw someone like Boebert to the curb, but to actually bring someone in who truly understands what it means to be a working person and the struggles of average everyday working people. And that's why I've asked Trisha Calvaris to come talk with us. She's the Democratic candidate for Colorado's fourth congressional district there in this special election. Trisha, thanks for taking time for us. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, brother. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. I'm a huge fan. Uh, love having you on the program. Uh, and, and look, uh, I love what you're doing out there talking about not just your story, but the story of working people. Um, you know, I, I saw your video and it, it touched me in a way that uh, many, many don't. 
But it's that story of, you know, hey, I was leading my life. My parents got sick. I had to come back and take care of them. And then all of the things that went into that, um, you know, those are stories we need to hear more of. Absolutely. And I am so fortunate that I could come home back to my home district where I went to public schools, born and raised, grew up when there were wild horses, right, in this part of Colorado. And, you know, I went east because that's where my opportunity was. That's where my full academic scholarship to Johns Hopkins was. But, you know, being far apart from my parents trying to coordinate care was always a challenge. Thank goodness for my local AFG 3403, I knew they'd have my back. So when my mom got her diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, I was able to drop everything, move back home to Highlands Ranch and provide end of life care for her through home hospice. And now, and she'd been taking care of my dad too, cause they were, you know, they were older and you know, he had kidney cancer, but he was on this amazing medicine because of his union pension benefits. He'd worked for the SEC and his union had his back. So he was able to be on this remarkable medication. It extended his life many years, uh, but he passed days after my mom. So again, I'm an only child. Thank goodness I could be there. I'm stepping up to run because no one should have to depend on luck. And as it is right now, like there are not enough people in unions to be able to have the benefits that I did to be there for their parents. Yeah, you know, when I tell stories that how fortunate I've been throughout my working life to have a union to make sure that I, I don't lose my job because I got sick or a family yeah. member got sick or or the health care that we've got that, you know, when I had my hip replaced, you know, it was it was 120 bucks out of pocket start to finish. I don't say that to brag. I say that because I want people to know that it's out there and it can be gotten because uh, we've been sold on this idea. Well, there's no other way. The Tina mentality. Well, there's there, there's no other there's no alternative. And there is. And that's why I think your story is special in that, you know, you're, when we talk about family values, we never really talk about the kind of stuff that you had to do and how you get to do it. Um, I, I, and I think it's important that we do. And my parents, to be very clear, they were conservatives. They were Catholic. They were Christian. And they raised me on those values 100 percent. And my dad's union, my union aligned with that completely, that I was able to come home. And they were able to pass at home with dignity. And, and again, that time being able to drop everything, leave my job, know that I would be covered, know that I would still have an income, know that I would still have insurance. I could drop all of it and be there for my mother, who I had realized like, oh my goodness, this was a burden she had carried her whole life where she was worried about this moment where, uh-oh, she's going to pass. She needs somebody there at the end to help lift that final, her final, you know, suffering, the yeah. final care. And to be there was the greatest gift I've ever had. That's, again, something everybody, every working person, everybody should have that right, should have that ability to take care of their family no, and, and look, should be able to help them, you know, pass at home if that's what they want. It was the most precious time no, and this comes that I ever had. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I got a little teary at it. But like, just this is coming for so many people in my generation. I'm, I'm an elder millennial or geriatric millennial, as they say. And, you know, my heart breaks for so many people in your generation, right, right of Gen X, where folks are taking care of, you know, their, their kids and their parents at the same time and working. So I wish for those folks a union because a union contract is the best way, is the best way to make sure that your family has what it needs in order for you to be able to take care of them directly. And, and again, that's a message we don't hear almost ever and you know especially in the halls of power and this is why i've i've said for years i want people who are going to who are going to know what walking a mile in my shoes is like i'm going to want people in congress in state legislatures who know what it's like to sit down at the kitchen table and worry about am i going to be able to pay the rent am i going to be able to put money away for my kids college you know What's going to happen at the end? Uh, will I be able to care for myself? And to have policies and people pushing policies that are going to help families get through these moments, not do it for them, but give them the opportunity to be able to do it. And I fear that we're going to a direction where that's no longer possible. I mean, that's right. And, and the caregivers, the care providers, I just want to talk about my hospice nurse who is there for my mom. Right. There's some questions where you go through end of life, like where you're like, oh, my goodness, this doesn't seem right. Like, help me through this. Help me through this. Where it wasn't she wasn't just there for my mother. Yeah. She was there for me. 
right? And then days later when my father passed, she like she made sure she was the one there. So a second time she came back for my, you know, for my father. And I know that I was just one call of the night, that that is her literal job. For me, I will never forget her. She was a stranger and she showed up for me. That woman should absolutely have enough income and benefits to take care of her own family, right? Like what an absolute angel who goes above and beyond every single day in, in her line of duty and in her work. What dignity? It's the dignity of work. And for working people is what I'm stepping up for, Rick. Absolutely. No, and I you know I, I I spent some time on your website and saw some things that you wrote about your your parents, uh, and especially your father. I, Rocky Mountain news story from 2003 of of you guys collecting toys for, uh, you know, for the holidays for for disadvantaged or for a woman's battered sh shelter, a uh, battered woman's shelter, and and you know it, it got me thinking, you know. We get into this red hat, blue hat stuff. We get into who'd you vote for in the last, last election instead of who people were. And you said your father was a conservative Republican, uh, which I don't think is recognizable in today's political climate. But, you know, it wasn't about who you voted for in that last election back then. It, it, that wasn't what you wore on your sleeve. So, you know, I, I kind of wonder, as you were brought up in this, you know, what did you take from 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 that that upbringing? Yes, sir. It's about our values. It's about the shared values of care, respect, dignity, community, right? That you always step up and serve wherever you can and you do as much good as you can. And I will say this before my dad passed, he knew, you know, Ken Buck was stepping down and he said, step up. This is a community that raised you. It's time to give back, step up and serve. So, you know, in a way it was my very first endorsement and, you know, it, it kind of, kind of makes me tear up to think about it, but his dying wish in a way, right? To step up and serve out of dignity, out of those those principles that are enduring, right? That we maybe have forgotten about, but where we're a community, you don't leave people behind. You step up, you serve, you care about your community. And I'll even say this, my mom was a Trump supporter. She loved him. She came from Pennsylvania. She came from a coal town. She knows what it's been like for decades of offshoring and outsourcing and being left behind. And I think honestly, her heart was a little bit heartbroken that even when it was time for me to find an opportunity, I had to go east. Because you know what? There are no four-year colleges or universities in my district. So that is that is what I'm fighting for. It's on those, those values of making sure that people can, you know, they can stay home, they can, be, they can participate in their own communities, and they can find a pathway to the middle class and to support their own families too, wherever they were raised. No, and, you know, I, 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 I'll tell you, this is part of what I think Biden has done very well. Um, you know, this idea of investing in communities, making, you know, local local communities the future instead of the past. You know, in 2022, we did one of our working class hero tours and we went to places that used to be uh, places that used to have factories that used to create jobs that used to create the kind of living that we now pine for. Uh, this year, we're working on, on a program to do another working class heroes tour, going to places that are going to be where we're investing in infrastructure, we're investing in, in new technologies, we're investing in the future. But sadly, this election is going to come down to the people that we put in into those halls of power if we maintain that direction or if we fall backwards, which, again, is why I think having someone with a working class background like you in the halls of Congress is so vitally important. Yes, sir. And who even understands the origin of these bills and what the intention was. It is the Build Back Better with unions agenda. So when I talk to the, you know, the business manager of the building trades of Colorado, and he's telling me, hey, we're kind of struggling with getting PLAs established from the beginning for this funding that's coming from the Build Back Better agenda. You send me to Congress, I promise you day one, I'm going to be writing letters to the Department of Commerce asking them to help help work with me to get this resolved. Because if it's a problem in Colorado, it's a problem at large. Like, let's get those PLAs like set. And I understand it. Like, like this is we're we're bringing unions in our movement where it hasn't been before. So it just you know we got to educate folks. We got to make sure it's there in the beginning. But like, we need a champion who understands that was the spirit of the law. That's what it's there for. That's where the money is. And I'm going to go in fearlessly and fight for it. And again, I come back to, you know, it's 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 rare you hear some a politician who talks about PLAs and actually knows what they are. 
And you said politician. I was like, uh, who, who, where is she? Who are you talking about? But like, you're a politician, Trisha. You're running for office. Right. But I like, I am a union sister. Like I am a union, like acolyte. Like I'm here to preach about like the labor movement and to move the ball forward. Because you know what? I have a shirt on right now. AFT. I am a product of AFT teachers. That was the greatest gift I ever had. I didn't do anything. I, I was simply born and I went to Douglas County public schools. One of the greatest things you could ever give a student, right, is, is the gift of an excellent public school education. So you better believe I'm turning right back around and I'm going to fight for the collective bargaining rights of, of teachers in Colorado and in the 4th District. Absolutely. Because they've been stripped. Collective bargaining rights can just be taken away like that from certain municipalities, from city governance. That's why we need, not, we need the PRO Act and Public Sector Freedom to Negotiate Act. No, and, and this is where having people who understand that in those positions is vitally important. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I do, I, you know, as I said, you know, I, was, I spent time watching your video. And one of the things that, that jumped out at me is, is you asked a simple question. And it said, you know, you said, what if we voted for dignity and hard work? And, you know, because our, our framing normally is red hat, blue hat, uh, right, left. Uh, me, the reality is, is most issues aren't right, left or red hat, blue hat. They're up, down. Uh, it, it comes down to do you have enough money and power to, to get what you need or don't you? Uh, but when you ask this question, what if we voted for dignity and hard work instead of what's been force fed to us? I said, you know, that's a that's the right frame. And, you know, explain that a little bit, what you meant by it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, compare me and Lauren Boebert, right? We're both millennial women. We both had family obligations. We both have careers. And just where she was disrupting people's evening out at the Buell Theater, like that working people had, you know, paid their, like saved money to go to that experience. She'd ruined it at Beale Juice, flipped off work, you know, made those working people at Buell Theater. It's like stressful enough of a job. You don't need a congressperson vaping in the face of a pregnant person and flipping you off too, right? So I'm at the same time Lauren Boebert was doing that. You know what I was doing? I, I was a federal employee fighting with everything I had to move the agenda forward, to bring STEM education and pathway jobs into the middle class back to places like Colorado for without requiring a four-year university degree. That's what I was doing. So that's when, when I say hard work, like I mean myself personally, a hardworking person with dignity and for all the people who have been working so hard for so long. I see y'all. I'm one of y'all. So I'm I'm stepping up to represent all of us. No, every presidential election, I say, I hope this president is the person who brings reward back to work. And I want to say that about, you know, congressional people, you know, who's going to be the one who's going to step up and get that legislation move forward that returns reward to work? Because the reality is, and I go back to your parents' generation, you know, they benefited from a very strong labor movement, union density as high as 35 percent in the late 60s. They benefited from a culture of, of of shared prosperity, whereas the future generations and right now we have a situation where corporate America is basically gouging our eyes out. And it doesn't seem like there is enough. There's enough in Congress uh, to, to wake us up to that and to and to fight back on that. Absolutely. And that's what's so interesting about being like an elder millennial, like I'm a bridge, I am a bridge. You see these younger kids, like they're ready for a revolution today, right? Like a full on revolution, which like, if we wanna manage change, let's start managing change. Like we need to make it so much easier for people to form unions. It's the most popular thing in the country, like 70% approval, right? People agree on that. You talk to people in white collar jobs, blue collar jobs, they agree. Unions are the path to the future. Well, I so, mean, you know, to be yeah. honest, you know, especially white collar jobs with the the uh, coming AI revolution that's coming, uh, the tsunami of job losses that could happen. You know, last study I saw said, you know, in, in the next 15 years, half of all the jobs we currently do could be wiped out. Uh, there's a moment for people to go in my radical self-interest. Maybe we should start protecting ourselves. That's right. And that's, this goes back to, it's very like humanizing to talk, like, right. To talk about family care, about how hard we've all worked through COVID about the toll of COVID. And once you kind of break through those things, like I'm hearing from people in Douglas County in these white collar tech jobs at IBM at places like Lockheed Martin, who are like, Ooh, I'm already seeing the effects of AI and I'm seeing it in a bottom 
you know, kind of bottom line in terms of like, oh, they fired people. I, you know, now I'm concerned. And they started to ask me like, so wait a second, what are these unions? You mean, so you mean you can have a contract and you can put in protections about AI? And then they look to the big wins at like SAG-AFTRA. Like that's why the labor movement's amazing, right? We have examples, we know how to do this. Um, so I'm, I am so excited to help bring that to the, to the next kind of, uh, industries of the future and white collar jobs. Let's no, go it's, it's incredible. Let's go. So last line of question I've got for you, you know, as you're out there, you know, doing the, the door knocking, the, you know, kissing babies and shaking hands and all that. Uh, what are the top issues that people are, are talking about to you and, and how do we, how do we fix them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, housing's a big issue. Um, the dollar is a big issue, right? Like there, it is literally a luxury to buy groceries for my generation. That's like the articles, but also the lived experience. I'm talking to folks on the ground and it's corporate price gouging. There's no reason food needs to cost as much as it does. Look at the top line. Like we need to hold corporations responsible. And I'm not, and to be clear, when I say corporations, there are a lot of like entrepreneurial, small business, like spirited people in the West. I'm not talking about that. I want you guys to be competitive. I want people in the trades to be able to go into their own industry, you know, to start do their own startups, have their own businesses. I'm talking about the concentrated power at the top, the yep. mega corporations who've been price gouging. The three or four corporations that control an entire industry from meat to cereal to whatever. Yeah. You've got right. these handful of corporations that have the kind of outweighted power to basically destroy any bit of competition and of course line their pockets because if you listen to their earnings call they're not they're not struggling uh, so right. i gotta tell you i wish you the best june 25th special election in colorado's fourth congressional district check out trisha's website uh, trisha the number four colorado.com we will get links out on social media but trisha calvaries i wish you the best always great talking with you you are amazing. Thank you. And solidarity. And solidarity forever. to you, sister. I appreciate it. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. What do you think? I got to tell you, big fan. Back after this. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1937. That was the day that workers at the Jones and Laughlin plant in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania, voted in the first ever union election in the United States steel industry under the National Labor Relations Board. The National Labor Relations Act had been passed two years earlier, guaranteeing workers the right to join and form a union. But the steel industry had long stood against union organizing. In Pennsylvania, anti-union bosses in steel and coal often had the backing of the state militia. Workers who dared to talk union were harassed and fired. George Laughlin, a steel worker at Jones & Laughlin, found out just how far the company would go to keep the union out of their plant. When George was injured on the job, he took up a part-time job organizing. The company pulled strings and had him committed to the state's lunatic asylum. He was only released after the governor intervened. Governor Griffin Pinchot was a progressive who dared to stand up to the steel companies. The passage of the National Labor Relations Act gave workers the support of the federal government to stand up for their rights as workers. After the votes were counted, it was declared that the workers had overwhelmingly chosen the Steel Workers Organizing Committee, or SWAC, as their bargaining agent. Jones and Laughlin agreed to rehire the workers that had been fired due to their union activity. They also had to pay these workers back pay and the company agreed to sit down and bargain with the union. The next year, the giant of the steel industry, U.S. Steel, signed its first contract with SWAP. Union recognition had finally come to the steel mills. Well, what did Jones and Laughlin steal? Pittsburgh. Labor History in Two brought to you by the what Illinois Labor History Jones Society and, and the Rick Smith Show. For more Pittsburgh. information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like what us on Facebook, Jones and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk. So Boeing uh, just gave their CEO uh, <laughs> a $33 million pay package. Evidently, shareholders approved it. Uh, look, th their CEO, Dave Calhoun, is about ready to leave the company uh, in disgrace. I mean, the weird thing is, is 
um, the company could be held criminally liable for, you know, the, 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 the crashing things. Um, and, and the weird thing is, is uh, you look at the amount of money this guy's getting, a massive increase. I think it was like 45% increase from the amount he received back in 2022. Um, and, and what they're calling the, the highest pay package ever. Uh, ever for a CEO at Boeing. And you go, well, what did, what did he do? What did he do? Well, truth of the matter is probably going to get them criminally prosecuted. Uh, now, in 2021, they avoided it. You know, that, that corporate thing uh, where they defer pro, you know, prosecution uh, so that you, you maybe, maybe you, you, do, you, you pay a big fine and you don't go to jail, but you promise not to do it again. And then over a period of time, um, if you don't, then they, they let it go. Well, it turns out two days before their agreement ended, uh, had another, had another incident could, could bring charges. Uh, but for that, uh, for that $33 million pay package for the CEO that is, is leaving in disgrace. It's amazing to me. Just amazing. Also story caught my attention. Uh, did you know CVS, uh, the drugstore people? They're the third largest uh, Medicare Advantage company in the country. They're the third largest. And their CEO or their CFO, a guy named uh, Thomas Cowhay. Uh, Thomas Cowhay uh, said that their goal in the next year uh, is margin over membership. Uh, he said... Uh, that they could lose up to 10% of our existing me Medicare members. Uh, is it, It's entirely possible. And that it's okay because they need to get back uh, in, um, back on business track. And understand, uh, they've lost a bit of money. Uh, I guess the first quarter earnings uh, was $900 million below what they had predicted and that they lost $400 million due to what was called heavy outpatient service utilization it means sick people people were sick went to the doctor people needed stuff so what are they going to do <laughs> uh the third largest insurer of of senior folk because remember they're sold medicare advantage could be all great uh it's going to get you all these cute little things uh you're going to get sneakers you're going to get gym memberships you're going to get discounts to cvs you're going to get all kinds of stuff amazing stuff it's going to be great so CVS, with its 4.2 million members, is talking about cutting 420,000 people from their roles. And I got to wonder which 420,000. Let's see. Uh, who could it possibly? Maybe the people who are the sickest. Maybe the people who use the uh, the insurance because they're, they're, you know, they need it. Maybe those folks. And this, again, is another reason why you don't privatize something vital like Medicare. Uh, or to me, the, the idea of privatizing healthcare is, is ridiculous. But understand, in this country, what we've done is we've taken the most costly of the healthcare recipients out of the equation. You know, young people and old people. Over half of the kids in this country are born with Medicaid. And, well, our old folks, uh, once you hit 65, and I'm hoping to get there myself, um, Medicare. But again, like everything uh, corporate America touches, um, it's about the profits. Everything that we used to do for ourselves as part of, of a social safety net, as part of the commons, as part of what, what Americans expect from their government, well, we can privatize, profitize, and, well, ration, because we need more profits, this being part of this. So am, am I surprised that they're going to get rid of 10%? And you know, again, you know it's 10% they're going to get rid of. The sick people, which, again, end up on the back of of Medicare. And this is the part that I have a struggle with because again, Medicare is the backstop for all of this. You have these advantage plans. You have these privatized plans who this guy's saying, look, it's about the money. Uh, the, the services we provide are secondary. It's about getting things back on business track. We need to make money. It's about profit. So what we do, so it's, it's all about the cash instead of about the service. And that's what Medicare was supposed to do. Say, look, it's not about the funding. It's not about the money. It's about getting the best results. It's about getting people well. It's about 
helping people. Uh, but not in this day and age. This day and age, it's about it's about the profits. So I'm curious, and I'm hoping that someone will reach out. Uh, have you heard from CVS? Are you a Medicare Advantage CVS holder? And are they sending letters on maybe who they're kicking to the curb? Have you had to use any of these services? Because, look, most people that I talk to who have uh, Medicare Advantage plans, they're great as long as you don't use it. But as soon as you have a chronic illness, as some seniors do, as some older folks do, well, it gets a whole lot more complicated. It gets a whole lot more hard to navigate the system with all of the, and we've, we've already seen the stories, with all the AI-generated uh, refusals and rejections. How much worse is it going to get? This is one of these moments where we, the people, need to claw back our Medicare from these corporate special interests and make sure that it's there when we need it. Want to hear your thoughts, though? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Miss any portion of the program? Grab the podcast. And as always, thanks so much for being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick, Email Rick. at rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.